What really worries me today is what's going to happen to us if machines can think. And what interests me specifically is, can they? Well, that's a very hard question to answer. If you'd asked me that question just a few years ago, I'd have said it was very far-fetched. And today, I just have to admit, I don't really know. Well, if you're confused, Doctor, how do you think I feel? This is AI for the Rest of Us, a podcast from the University of Texas at Austin. I'm Mark Earhart. And I'm Casey Boyle. This is a show that helps explain artificial intelligence, what it means, who it affects, and what you need to know right now. I'm convinced that machines can and will think in our lifetime. There is going to be all this automation. People are going to be out of work. Computers are taking over now. Here I am playing chess with a computer. And then I just flick a switch on the modem and replace the receiver. I'm now waiting for the computer to answer me. Today on AI for the Rest of Us... How do you build nuance into the model? And then how do you get rid of lunacy that gets in there? And that's the difficulty. Hey, Mark. Hey, Casey. We have a special episode for you today. Here on the UT campus at a live event at Cactus Cafe, I interviewed world-renowned tech reporter and author and podcaster Kara Swisher. She has been in the room with many of the most powerful people shaping our future with AI and technology, and she's frank about it. Her latest bestseller, Burn Book, has been described in ways that feel important for a discussion about AI for the rest of us. As her book jacket says, when tech titans crowed that they would, quote, move fast and break things, Kara Swisher was moving faster and breaking news. But she still has a lot of optimism about how technologies, including AI, can solve problems rather than create them. And she says that requires all of us. This interview has been edited for length and clarity. And now, without further ado, Here's our conversation. I'm too short for this chair. These are Texas-sized chairs, and I'm a San Francisco-sized lady. (laughs) So um, some of the questions I have come from Kara's uh, most recent book, Burn Book, which I can't recommend highly enough. While in college, you spent a lot of time studying the past. I did, I did. I'm a history wonk. But you end up covering a field that's all about the future. It is, but one of the things, what I was studying was was communications and propaganda. Mm. I was super attracted to propaganda and the uses of it and how to move civilizations and things like that. And so I was always really interested in how leadership manipulates. I don't mean that in a bad way necessarily, but moves populations, how people change, how things shift. And so... I was always just very interested, whether it was China, whether it was Nazi Germany, Italy during the Mussolini time, the things they did. It was just an interest of mine. And then when I saw the internet, I was like, oh, whoa, 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 this is a big deal. It's a worldwide network of communications that was instant, was really something powerful. How does your interest in the past feed the work you did going forward? Well, I think I had a, you know, one of the things that's important is to understand that everything is technology. A spear is technology, right? And so you have to, like the the printing press, I'm not going to go into detail about the printing press, but the things that happened to it, the ability, you know, it's something that's not really well known. Everyone talks about how science was distributed through the printing press, and that's why science got bigger. Actually, the most, this is really interesting, Rachel Maddow told me this, but the book that was thought of was popular was Copernicus's, but it was a it was a loser book during the early days. I know it was. It was an important book. Copernicus was a big deal. But the the winning book of that era that was a bestseller essentially was a book called The Hammer of Witches. It was it was a conspiracy theory book. Yeah. And that's what the first printing presses were were and that went everywhere and informed people and led to deaths of thousands of people. Yeah. And so that to me was fascinating. Right. Like everyone thinks it was for illumination and it was in fact for decimation of people. So I that it just interested me. And then I so I quickly saw that this was both a tool and a weapon. And every single technology that we've ever made has been made into a weapon. All of them, yeah. you know, it's sort of, and I talk about it in the book as a Star Wars versus Star Trek. Star Wars is all about destruction and death, and Star Trek is about hope, yeah. visionary, and the uses of technology to unify. Right. And I was worried about the Star Wars version taking over. So I, I'm going to f- stay on the subject of, of college, and my bosses are here, so just mm-hmm. uh, okay. be kind. Um, okay, don't go to college. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that's basically what my question is. Um, yeah. 
in the book, you mentioned that college felt like a waste of time for you. For me, yes. For you. That's what, mm -hmm. yeah, I wanted to say that a couple times. Mm -hmm. For you. Um, for <laughs> since AI can now do a lot of heavy lifting. Yes. And I'm, you know, in a department of rhetoric and writing. Uh-huh. And I often think that students think that their writing classes, perhaps, are a waste of time since machines can do heavy lifting now. Well, uh, they've already, you want to talk about doing that. Of course it can, but yeah. so can machines. You know, one of the things that I, what I try to get through to academics and others who are yeah. more, including journalists, right? Journalists are always in a panic about something. And um, I was, two things. I was at this dinner, uh, I'm on, I serve on a board to give awards to younger journalists. When AI first started last year, everyone was sort of not understanding it. And I right. was the one in the room who has been meet, talking and meeting with these people a lot. And I was less concerned because I, I'm sort of like, can you resist the car? Can you resist electricity? Like, it's better if, if you use it correctly. And so one of the arguments I, I, I had was that certain jobs will be automated. And the yeah. theme of this book is everything that can be digitized will be digitized. Right. And you couldn't say, oh, so sorry, but that's what's going to happen right. because it's efficient, it costs less, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is, what's lost doing it? Are we lost because we can't do cursive writing anymore? Some may argue. One of the things that I was trying to get through to a lot of the journalists was things where we could do a better job and then focus on the better stuff yeah. would be to get the, the scut work out of the way. And in one case at the journal, I was doing earnings, I remember. And I was always like, why don't the computers do this? Like, right. why am I wasting precious minutes of my life writing these right. when it's not something that requires creativity? And the same thing with headlines. One of the things I said to one of the uh, reporters is like, well, they can come up with 100 headlines and then the editor picks two. Yeah. Meanwhile, some guy in the corner takes 45 minutes to do one bad one. Like, why are we doing that? It doesn't make any sense. And they were like, we have to do our headlines. I'm like, but we don't. And they were like, we must. I said, Head, you're gonna, this is the hill you're going to die on, the headline hill? The hill you don't do <laughs> a better, hill. that much of a better hill. And this is the gal that won the Golden Pike Award at Columbia Journalism School. So I'm good at headlines, but I even know AI does it better. Yeah. And so I think the question is, what can you use it for that improves some experience to allow you to do something more creative? And I think yeah. that's a better way to look at it than how are they going to cheat, which I think a lot of Oh yeah, 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 but you know what? Students have been cheating. Since oh yeah, we the don't. Fifth we, century. This is right? not a, so a new just, thing. It's a for new us. way we to cheat, it, yeah. right? What What I find is a lot of people aren't using it, so they don't. It's like people who didn't use the internet, right? And I think everyone should take it upon themselves to try all of them, to use them, yeah. to see where they're effective, and then see where they're not effective. Right, right. I mean, this kind of goes along something I've often thought about is that we think of something like AI as some new thing, and it's often not. It's some often of it is. some of it is sure, but it's often repeating the same kinds of stuff. And in the book, you've you've drawn parallels between early days of the internet, of social media, and mm -hmm. now AI in the current state of sure. AI. As it becomes more integrated into our lives, AI that is, what lessons should we learn from those booms and busts that have happened before? Well, a few key ones is that you shouldn't let three major companies control all of it. Like That's, that's really, or four, giving enormous amounts of power to yeah. pe certain people right. should not be happening without government regulation over safety. Like we wouldn't let pharmaceutical companies do, I mean, they get enough, away with enough, but at least they're regulated. Yeah. So are car companies, so are plane companies. And one of the things I always point out when I, I spend a lot of time in Washington, I live there most of the time right mm -hmm. now, is that, you know, you have something like a, a, an accident with an airplane, with the Alaska Airlines thing. That happens, and Boeing comes under investigation. The CEO is fired. There's lawsuits everywhere. There's state lawsuits. There's state investigations over one door. Yeah. Meanwhile, over Facebook, yeah. you know, they're ruining the lives of our teen girls. Not a word. And, peep. and so the question is, how much regulation can you put on without hindering innovation. Because some of the stuff they talk about, like we cannot be regulated because then it will scotch our vibe. Right. It's not true. Um, but what, what safety can we put in? What are the things we should anticipate that we could have anticipated very easily about social media or concentration of power, which yeah. is nothing new in the American experience. It yeah. happened over and over again. What kinds of regulation should we have had for social media, for instance? Well, any. Would any, be good. Yeah, that would be a good start. Yeah. We don't have any. Yeah. I mean, that is astonishing. What an these are trillion dollar companies, they're the, mo the most valuable companies in the world, and there's no regulation 
save for the fact they can't kill people. But, uh, yeah. you know, I think a couple of things around safety, around antitrust. They shouldn't be, like, it shouldn't be Microsoft, Meta, Google, and Elon Musk. Right. And Amazon running the show. It just shouldn't be. Because yeah. it'll quelch innovation that could be very powerful for yeah. people around cancer, around all kinds of things. We shouldn't be dancing to their tune. Yeah. They should be dancing to ours as, as a citizenry kind of thing. Um, so basic safety regulations, a transparency of the algorithm so we understand. This is not, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken and a secret recipe, freaking recipe. Right. <laughs> Just what's in it? What's, right. you know, we wouldn't allow it in food. We shouldn't allow it here. An ability for government to change regulation time and not to be overwhelmed by the lobbying might of these yeah. companies. It's crazy how much money they have to do that. And then, you know, the way they've infected our social world with their crazy ideas like we have to we're subject to their whatever whims these billionaires have and some of them are nice but some of them aren't and some of them are quite malevolent you talked about the ideas that they have and how they shape our experiences and Mm -hmm. and it's not just the deployment of the technologies and the platforms but it's also and as a researcher in rhetoric and writing Mm -hmm. the the metaphors they use uh, have real material effects they do so, for instance, I'm I'm kind of interested in, and maybe you can speak to this a little bit, is the chatification of everything. Yeah. It's chat GBT, it's chatbots, mm-hmm. it's all of that sort of taking meaningful information or knowledge and turning it into something like chatter. Yeah, uh, I would you agree. Speak to yeah, you, you heard the word snackable? No, I didn't. Yeah, snackable content. That's an awful one. It is an awful one, else you get fat. Um, I'll <laughs> tell you, what other industry calls their audience users? Drugs. That's correct. Thank you. There you yeah. go, Mr. Rhetorician. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about that. They're uh, not people. They're users. Yeah. Yeah. Therefore and, addicted. Therefore, right. let's take all their things. And you've spoken about this a bunch, about like social media being like, uh, you know. Um, Casino. Casinos, yeah. Drugs. It is. There's elements. Of, we've never studied this. It should be studied. It should be, you know, just the way we did with cigarettes or anything else. Many years ago, I did an interview with Mark Benioff, who I like a great deal. Mark Benioff talked about how Facebook was a cigarette company, and I thought he had it just right. I was shocked yeah. he said it out loud. You know, but at the time when he said it, they treated him like he was a class trader for yeah. pointing out the very deeply obvious, which was that this was, it's not only addictive, it's necessary. You can't work without it. Yeah. So it's necessary, addictive, and controlled by an increasingly small amount of very rich people. Yeah. And I think that the idea that they have so much control over your privacy, over knowing everything about you, and it's all private companies, can be very easily degenerated in a fascist society, an authoritarian society. And you right. see it in the authoritarian societies almost constantly. Right. We pretend that can't happen, but it absolutely can happen here. Switching topics a little bit, I want to talk about labor and AI. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there's widespread warnings about AI taking jobs and, and, mm-hmm. and vacating positions. I mean, other industries for a long time have automated and sure have. Have vacated jobs in agriculture, mining, manufacturing, mm-hmm. even media, right? Right. How do you see the future of AI and managing work and labor dynamics? Well, it will take jobs that are rote, that's for sure, non-creative jobs. I mean, legal, you can look at like certain things have enormous amounts of data. It's going to make sense. Very similar to mechanized farming, right? The yeah. Farmers were entrepreneurs, really, if you think about it. They were the original entrepreneurs mm-hmm. deciding things. You know, boy, what a job that is right. if you're not doing it in a mechanized way. And so, you know, jobs that are require a lot of data... I always use this example of my brother, and I've, made, I've done it many times, but he's, a, he's an anesthesiologist, and he consults ChatGPT and everything else because it gives him 100 ideas rather than three from his colleagues. And so what does that do to jobs? It ta- meaning if you're a lawyer, law firm, you're going to need three lawyers rather than 30. Right. Right? And it makes sense because, or, or you don't need paralegals. You don't need this because it will give you an answer. But by the way, the same thing is going to happen to Google. You know, there's all these people working on search at Google. You're not going to need search. It's just going to tell you what it is. And it's bad right now, and people always make fun of it, right? Gives you the wrong answers. You know, James Moreau is still living, apparently. Whatever. (laughs) It won't give you the wrong answers in three years. It will give you the exact right right answers. Right, you'll refine that. A hundred percent. So it will replace a lot of jobs. It's just a question of what... We've had it happen before. It's just never been at this speed and... It was actually the speed. The shift to manufacturing yeah. was 
brutal in We're our blessed. country. Yeah, absolutely. We're but still we, feeling the effects of that. By the right? way, we forgot it was brutal. There were right. there were fights, there were wars, there was they destroyed machines. You know what I mean? This yeah. was a social problem, and that's what we're undergoing now, and including in manufacturing, because I think that's going to change with these new metal. Th- there's all these new materials, mm-hmm. technologies that are super interesting. And so, yeah, I think any information business is going to be affected really drastically. What industry should embrace AI more? Of all of them? Yeah. Everyone? Figure out every single everyone. business you're in. If you're in a business, if you're in insurance, how can you make... AI work for you? And what could it make more efficient, better, yeah. better decision making, get rid of rote stuff? If you're in medicine, you have to figure out like the gene stuff is riveting. Yeah, yeah. Cancer research, drug discovery, drug interaction kills a lot of people, as it turns out. This can help. Um, if you're in manufacturing, you may not need it as much. If you're in plumbing, you don't need it at all. You know what I mean? Like, it, right. or maybe a little, yeah. like to get answers kind of stuff. And so you have to sort of apply it the way you would the internet. Again, going back to that, what do I need? Like one of the, when I first started covering the internet, I got it pretty quickly. And someone said to me, what is the internet? What is it? And I go, it's everything. Yeah. And they're like, what does that mean? I'm like, it's everything. And they're like, what do you mean everything? I go, what's the world? The world is trees and cars and streets and houses. Like, it's everything. Yeah. And that's hard to mentally yeah. think about. So I don't know. It depends on the job. Gotcha. It's interesting because we've made this connection between this kind of tech and drugs. Mm-hmm. Drugs are highly regulated. Whenever you experiment, there's mm-hmm. lots of closed conditions for this. They, yeah. Lots of trials, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But tech, we get experimented on Openly, freely, publicly, That's correct. all the yeah. time. We're the guinea pigs, yeah. Yeah, so like, how do we regulate that? Or well, I think we in? need to understand what they know. They yeah. know, like Facebook does know about the effect on teen girls. They know it. They know. Let's see your data. Let's right. let's let's sample and see your data. We got little bits of it through Francis Hogan, but right. let's really actually, if it doesn't really affect elections, please show us. Thank right. you for that. Like, yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with demanding that we see that it doesn't affect elections, right? Opening up the research, opening up the algorithm, understanding what goes into the AI right. models. Like, what's in there? Yeah. What do you got in there? Like, is there red dye number three in there? Because I don't think it's good yeah. for society to have that. Like, that's the kind of stuff. The The transparency of the process, the provenance of the information, yeah. I think is critically important. Like, right. where did it come from? Where did you get it? And especially when it comes to things like justice, like, are you putting in files from certain parts of this country? Because they're pretty biased over there, right? And so, like, very clearly you could go, well, women aren't CEOs. Well, they aren't because they aren't, right? Right. But they aren't CEOs, but they aren't because they weren't. Right. But it doesn't mean they can't be. Same thing with people who commit crimes. Oh, you know, people of color are more criminals. Why? Because, because the data the says so. Yeah. But it's not true. They get arrested. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have any nuance. And so right. how do you build nuance into the model? And then how do you get rid of lunacy that gets in there? And that's right. the difficulty. Because a lot of, like, whoever, there's an expression in computing, garbage garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. I think that's it, Right. That's how it goes. Like right. garbage, but good stuff goes in. Good stuff's going to come out. It's just right. a question of who puts the parameters right. and who takes them out. And one of the things I always think about was, you know, the question is when it becomes sentient, right? Mm-hmm. And when do we start treating these robots like not what they are? Right? right. They're not going to be like this. They're going to be some. They're going to feel. Right. Very much like they're part of your life. Yeah. And years ago, I, inter- I interviewed Jared Leto, who's really very geeky and very smart guy. And he was in that remake of Blade Runner. And he played a trill- the world's first trillionaire, right? Who yeah. had been creating, he was trying to get these computer beings to be pregnant. Remember? That was yeah, yeah. the whole premise. Yeah, yeah. And so one of them comes out and is not pregnant the way he wants them to be. And so he takes a knife and kills her yeah. like this, and with a, just like that, like that. Right. And I said to him, I said, what were you thinking when you did it? Because it was so jarring to watch Mm -hmm. it because it's a computer, but he's killing it, right? And he said, what? It's an iPhone. That's how he thought of it as he was doing the acting. He's like, it's just an iPhone I threw out. Right. And I was like, well, it is, isn't it? Like, so that's the, there's all these questions once we start to have these relationships with these AI assistants, which they're going to be, right now they're just irritating on Google. How would you like to write that email? Would you like me to write that email for you? You're getting all that on Google right now? No, I got the email. Please Please, stand down. 
you want me to summarize it? No, I don't. Thank you. It says hello, and that's it. <laughs> call me. Would you like? Literally, I had one someone writing me, call me, and said, would you like me to summarize it? I'm like, I would love to see how you would summarize. Call me. <laughs> I should have pressed it. I didn't. I was like, you irritating. So what's going to... AI. I mean, it's obvious, but I, I have a hard time coming up with positive questions. Um, positive. I love technology. That's why it's called a tech love story, because the, the, the stuff we can do through technology, I mean, even just, you know, like solving polio, solving, like, it's just an astonishing thing that we can make our lives better. We can give people meaningful work. We yeah. could learn in all kinds of new ways. I'm really a believer in that, yeah. that there's all these... If it was shared by everyone, if the wealth was shared by everyone, if we figure out a way to train people in really interesting ways, there's the, the possibilities are endless. And my fear is that it coalesces to a small group of people, as yeah. do many things. Yeah. It tends to happen that way. It doesn't have to. Right. It can be like illuminating. Think about, you know, solving cancer. What a thing, right? What a thing that would be. Like, And then it presents all kinds of other issues. But... Right. Wow, like yeah. a needless or solving oh, all kinds of things. We've arrived at rapid fire rounds. Sure. What part of your job would you like to hand over to AI starting Monday morning? Oh, I, one I'm working on right now is transcription of like our, my podcasts into other languages. Oh, um, nice. We're really interested in that. Like pivot in German would be mm -hmm. fantastic. That's like nice. the, <laughs> I don't speak German and Scott certainly doesn't speak English hardly, but, um, but, uh, but he does. I'm teasing. He's back. I'm so thrilled. I always think around what we said and going back and making other shows out of things we said and nice. pulling them out. Oh, like, nice, yeah. What's everything we said about teen girls and make a show out of it? Oh, that's like, nice, yeah. That kind of thing. Gotcha. Like, that's what I think about. All right. What obsolete or failed technology do you miss? Oh, so many of them. I still like the Vision Pro. I know I was wrong, but I love it. I think it's great. Um, well, they're gone, so I don't miss them, I guess. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. I always say Google Reader because I loved Google oh, Reader. Oh, did you like that? I did. Yeah, she yeah. didn't, obviously, but yeah. Yeah, I liked it. Yeah, that, I think that was the Twitter people started that. They people really? went on to Twitter. And then they went on to you know what I miss? Old Twitter. All right, next question. Uh, who is your favorite tech bro? Oh, wow. I would say Cuban. Cubes. He's funny. I mean, I don't know what they think of me here in Texas, but he's- a good I'm, guy. I'm from Dallas. I'm a fan. He's a learning organism and he's yep. trying to figure it out. Like we had a big argument about wealth tax and- I had to listen to him and he had some good points. Like, you know, I don't agree with him completely, but it was an interesting, he's willing to have discussions and yeah. I really appreciate that. I like Mark Benioff. There's a lot. I like Satya Nadella. I have great respect for him. He's the CEO of Microsoft. What a nice, what a, what a thoughtful person. Yeah. Should we say please and thank you to our digital assistants? Yes, of course. We should say please and thank you to everybody, but yes. Do you ride in autonomous vehicles? Of course, always. I'm like the original person. I did it years ago. I was in the Waymos very early. I did. I rode in one of the first Google little cars. They had a little car. It was like a yeah. clown car. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, you can look look it up. It's back in 2008, and I loved it. I was like, this is fantastic. I tried to get it to run over its found the founder of the company, but it wouldn't do it. <laughs> I'm like, go, go, and they it wouldn't. No, I can't. I'm like, you can. You can do it. Like, so um, I love them. I ride them all the time. I realize all the problems with them, but mm -hmm. they are, once you start using them, you will really get why they're very cool. They're, I, I know I get the job thing. I get the whole thing, but it's, they're fascinating. And yeah. boy, AI is critically important to those. I like them. I shouldn't. Although the other day I was driving one and cause it's San Francisco. Cause, and again, if you live in San Francisco, you have to put up with this. The guys rode in front of the Waymo the entire way back from the game and kept every time the Waymo moved, the person, the bike yeah. moved and it took me 17 hours to get home. And I loved, I filmed the whole thing cause it was funny, but like everyone else behind us took a left. Like, yeah. And I kept going to the Waymo, take a left, this idiot, take a left. But the Waymo wouldn't take a left. Oh, yeah. It kept going. So wow. I was sort of like, you got to get a Waymo that will listen to you. Take a left. All right. Last uh, rapid fire question. Would you be a passenger in an autonomous plane? I'm about to. Really? Yeah. Well, actually, it's, it's not autonomous. So let me say it's a, it's a hydrogen powered plane, which is even worse. Good, look good knowing you, everybody. Uh, yes, I would. Yes, I would. Yes, I would, eventually. Yeah, you are in a lot, you do a lot more autonomous things yeah. than you realize. Right. I, right? I bet it's already like 80% autonomous, well, right? Well, exactly. Yeah. A lot of them. I suppose you want one person up there, I suppose. Yeah. Liability sponge. Right, whatever. exactly. Yeah. You've tried these a lot of these things more than you realize. Yeah, yeah. And you will be, the problem with driving, eventually, you will become to realize is people. Yeah. People should not be driving because yeah. they get yeah, into yeah. accidents. And, and, and autonomous cars will learn. 
You will also be in something called vertical lift and takeoff vehicles, which are really interesting. I have not yeah. gotten in one of these yet. I, I want to. What they do is they take off like this. Yeah. They take up straight up. And they're for cities, so you avoid a lot of congestion. So you go from rooftop to rooftop yeah. on these, like in the San Francisco Bay Area, instead of going over the Golden Gate Bridge, yeah. you take a velo to the other spot and mm. then take a Waymo from there, which well, is really yeah. interesting. Um, it's pretty cool. Some of this stuff is pretty cool. And I don't know, space travel, no, I'm not going. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, I've been told it's time for all sure, these questions. questions. So we're going to start there. I have a question. You started talking about studying Germany and China and other places. Mm -hmm. We've talked mostly about AI in a U.S. context. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on the sort of deglobalization and how technology has helped that for a while, but maybe what AI means in it other means parts of the world? Once again, the, the rest of the world, I'm talking about the democratic world. Let's separate the democratic world from the Chinas and the autocracies, which are going to abuse it terrifically because it's a way to control their citizenry. But, uh, you know, the democratic world, unfortunately, say Europe, the reason Europe's been so tough is they get none of the benefits from these big companies and all the headaches, right? They don't get to have these companies in their country or have all the trillions of dollars they, they bring back into these countries. I think, I think there has to be a global decision making. One of the things I try to do is be irritating to public policy people. And I happen to be at a dinner with Tony Blinken. He's busy now, obviously, but this was before a lot of these recent terrible things he has to deal with, which are much more important in the moment. But one of the things I told him is we have to have a global, in the democratic countries, decision-making on AI safety because it's a global issue. It's not a U.S. issue. And by the way, the U.S. does the worst job of regulating compared to Europe. And it shouldn't be regulated by Europe either. It should be a global decision-making the way we have decisions on nuclear war, or all kind, we do it all the time on lots of things. And so we should be able to have a global decision making on standards of AI. Like, let's all decide not to have killer drones. Okay, good. Right? That kind of thing. Let's all decide not to be able to do this. Let's all pick what we don't want to do and then try to, let's all decide a certain level of safety and privacy and what can go in there and transparency. I think it has to be within the democratic country's decision making process. That includes big companies, by the way. They should be included, for sure. What capability would an AI have to evolve or develop for you to feel like we have an ethical responsibility to its existence? Here's what I would advise. Go watch some sci-fi, because some of it's really fascinating. Like some of these movies, there's a bunch of robot movies, and there's a bunch of movies about robots and our relationship with them over time. Some of them are terrible. Some of them are really wonderful. Here's a movie you should pay attention to, and is... Um, Minority Report is a Tom Cruise movie. There are ideas in there they're already doing. Like if you start to look at them, that is a really interesting idea of what we control and what we don't. And these were people, but were they people? Were they computerized? And it, so it starts to really, it, it's just, I think society has to think about it. Like think about what we're doing and what we, because it creates a class of, you know, it, I was just watching the recent Planet of the Ace, which wasn't very good actually, the new one, but that's about computer. Yeah. That's a, it's not about apes. It's about other beings that take over us. And so, so I think it's really important to think about it in advance and have writers. There's great writers. There's a, there's a great writer I, that I interviewed who did um, Candy House. Read Jennifer Egan's latest book. I did a great interview with her. You should listen to that. It's about a, a rich guy who owns a, a service, uh, you know, sort of a search mogul, yeah. a billionaire. And you can upload your consciousness into it but you can only access other people's consciousness if you upload yours. Otherwise, you can't see it. But the idea of who owns your consciousness was, is not far away. Could you talk a little bit about the religious applications of AI? <sighs> Have you been on some of these Bible apps? They're fascinating. Could it stand in for yeah. God in a conversation? Well, it kind of is, isn't it? It knows everything. Google was God before, right? This is just a better God, like it was smart. I mean, in a way, we have made information God, right? We have, and we make its purveyors our gods. And then we use, and, the, and the, the way we decide they're important is their wealth, which is, has nothing to do with wisdom, right? And so I think it's a really good question. If, if something knows everything all the time, what is that? That is God, right? That is, it's the thing is, can they do something about it? Right. And yeah. Can they fix us and make us better? In general, I feel like you need more community time with regular people like this. Like this is I know it sounds like trite to say that, but 
there's a reason I had four children. I wanted to have connection with people, right? I thought it was really important. And I think it's very, we've lost so much of our community and COVID really did a number on our country and our world. And so the anything that you can do to find connection, I think there's nothing more powerful than that. I, I honestly don't. And that can't be replaced by AI. Community can't be, creativity really can't be. It really can't. They just, they, they don't, it doesn't have an ability to do that yet. And so I think that when you think of the creative things you can do, it's almost impossible to, to computerize creativity. It really is on, on many levels. Well, that's so. a perfect way to end tonight's conversation. That's our show. A huge thank you to Kara Swisher for joining us. If you'd like to hear more from her, check out her own podcasts, On with Kara Swisher and Pivot. And while we're talking podcasts, I have an important update about ours. We'll be on a brief hiatus for a few weeks and then be back in your feeds with another special episode taped in front of a live audience, this time about the intersection of AI and energy. If you're used to catching us every two weeks, you'll have to wait just a little longer for this one, but it'll be totally worth it. So stay tuned. AI for the Rest of Us is a production of the University of Texas at Austin's College of Natural Sciences and College of Liberal Arts. Our show is part of the university's Year of AI. To learn more, visit yearofai.utexas.edu. For more links and more resources on today's topic, go to aifortherest.net. More thanks to our guest, Kara Swisher. Our executive producers are Christine Sinatra and Dan Oppenheimer. Sound design and audio editing by Robert Scaramuccia. Our theme music is by Aeolos Rue. Our interviews are recorded by the fabulous audio engineers at the Liberal Arts ITS Recording Studio. Thanks for listening. <laughs>